Hey folks, this is Adam Marcus, director of Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, and you're listening to Dr. Chris's Radio of Horror. This is Dr. Chris's Radio of Horror program. If you're not catching this during this broadcast of this recorded interview, hopefully you're catching this on the Radio Horror YouTube channel, which will be playing alongside his director's interview. Uh, tonight on the show with us, we have from Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, and an upcoming documentary about Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, we have writer, director, Adam Marcus on the show with us, a longtime get of the show, as this is the first Friday the 13th movie I ever watched in a theater when I was a child, long before I probably should have watched this movie. Thank you for coming on the show with us, Adam. My absolute pleasure, Chris. What brought on to make a documentary about Jason Goes to Hell? <laughs> it seems like every one of the Friday the 13th movies is getting like a documentary. I don't know if you've noticed that. Yeah, well, they're all getting them since. Here's what happened. There was one done about part three a couple of years ago that uh, was not really. It's, it's like 45 minutes long. It's really short. Half of it is kind of a documentary, but they couldn't get Steve Miner to get involved. A lot of the actors wouldn't come back. And then they made like a fan film they attached to the documentary. So suddenly it goes into a fan movie in the middle of the doc. Wow. Um, yeah, it was weird. And honestly, uh, that was the only one that had happened for a while because Crystal Lake Memories is such a – that and His Name Was Jason. Those are such huge documentaries. They're so lengthy that I think most of the filmmakers in the films kind of went, well, why are we bothering? Um, what happened with with mine was that for years I've been asked to do a documentary on this movie. Um, for probably the last 10, 10, 12 years, people have been asking me to do one. And, Holy. Uh, and, yeah, and I really didn't have anything to say. I'm like, guys, what am I going to talk about? Like, I've, I've been interviewed. I've talked about this. It's all good. And you have a commentary um, on the movie, so. <laughs> exactly. So I'm like, I, like what am I going to illuminate? Well, this kept persisting. So... Finally, there was this uh, this young guy who brought me. Um, he he came to me and said, "I want to make a documentary about this movie, but I don't want to make it if you're not involved." And I was like, "Okay." I said, "Well, all right. What, how are you going to prove to me you want to make this documentary?" He says, "Well, I've gotten letters of interest from about twelve people." I was like, "Oh, okay. Who'd you get?" I got Kane Hodder. I'm like, "Oh, uh, okay. All right. Well, if you're actually if you've gone around and asked people and they've signed off." Um, that's interesting. So I started to work with this guy and he's very sweet, very well intentioned, wanted to make a movie, but he never directed anything, let alone a documentary. And he, and I kept saying, well, what is your documentary about? Well, the making of your movie. Yeah, that's dude. That's a behind the scenes edition on a, on a, on a DVD or a Blu-ray. I'm, I'm not interested in making that. I don't want to make that. I, that's, that's totally not interesting to me. I said, we've done those. And I did do the commentary and what are you illuminating? So we went on and on and on about this. And for years, this guy just kept on me about this doc. So finally, uh, what had happened was last year on my birthday, on July 24th, there were a couple of guys, uh, TJ Bowser and Corey Kaufman, uh, made a Jason Goes to Hell, the final fan page, fan page on Facebook. I thought it was very sweet. They made it for my birthday. Like it was a birthday present, right? These, just these two fans. And uh, TJ had interviewed me once for his, for his network and a uh, really sweet guy and, and, and really knew the movie and blah, blah, blah. Huge fan. And overnight, the page became like a thing. And suddenly I'm getting literally thousands of messages from fans. And I went, oh, shoot, this is really a thing. Like the, the, this, people really want this. So my response to was, I said, look, I said, I I'm happy to produce and I'm not directing and I'm happy to produce the movie through my company, through Skeleton Crew. Um, but I'm only going to do it if the, if the fans really want it, then the fans can pay for the movie. Then, then I will do a fan funded film to make this doc. We went out on Indiegogo <laughs> and we got funded lickety split. I, I couldn't believe we were funded. We went into in demand on 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 Indiegogo. We're still on in demand in Indiegogo. Uh, the movie is fully financed, and um, and people keep contributing, which is allowing us to do more animation and more like cool stuff for the movie. And uh, we have done thirty one interviews so far, with another eight coming that we had to postpone because of the pandemic. 
I realized what the story should be for the movie, and I, I brought it to the director that I ended up hiring for the film because the original director, we put him on as a producer, and I said, look, I said, I'm not giving you my life rights. You haven't directed anything. That's insane. Um, I said, but you'll, be, you know, you'll still be a producer on the project. And he was thrilled. He, I think he was relieved, actually. I think he started to get really nervous when suddenly we were really making a movie. And um, so I brought on Eddie Samuelson from from Brooklyn, who's you know terrific documentarian, who's been doing all the Scream Factory releases for forever, um, and uh, and he's just a really sharp, smart dude. So I brought him on, but I also brought on Peter Bracky, who wrote Crystal Lake Memories. Oh yeah, Craig, Peter's been on the show. He's awesome. He he's is a, an incredible dude. That and, interview could have gone for hours because it's 12, uh, thir- 12 right. 11, 10, whatever, how many films. It's, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, it's 12 movies. Um, but here's the thing. Um, with Peter, Peter had initially called me. This is how this whole thing with Peter and Eddie got, how it happened, how this all gelled. Um, because there is a, um, a rumored reissuing of a lot of these movies coming, uh, Peter had called me and said, look, um, we're, we're, we're talking about doing this special edition. I can't say whether it's happening or not, but we're talking about doing this special edition of Jason Goes to Hell uh, on Blu-ray for the very first time. I said, oh, okay, cool. He said, we're doing, you know, we want it, we're, we're proposing like behind the scenes docs and some new, uh, you know, new interview with, with people like yourself. And um, really interested in doing maybe even a commentary track, like an updated commentary track and that kind of thing. I said, okay, it all sounds great. He says, but I want to know if you would be, you know, if you would be heavily involved in this thing. And I said, I said, okay, well, uh, two things. I said, first, um, if Sean Cunningham is heavily involved, I want nothing to do with it. And he was like, wow. I said, yeah. Yikes. Yeah. We all know that story. So you definitely don't have to go into the whole the right. lawsuit let's we've well, covered no, it we've no, covered no, it let's just say and anyone who wait, wants no, to know no, anything no, about it but by, by the way this isn't anything about the lawsuit oh, okay all right not about the lawsuit okay not about the lawsuit okay okay that's fine <laughs> no this is this is about the fact that sean has been um horrible to me since we made the movie um to the point where he has lied so egregiously over and over again that my lawyers keep wanting to go after him. And I'm like, guys, eh, forget. And by the way, you know, especially with the rights the way they are, who knows what will be left after all of this happens. But um, Sean has been out and out lying about that movie for, for 25 years. Mm-hmm. And so um, so anyway, I said, look, I said, you know, Sean's, a, Sean's not a very nice man. Um, he has not treated me well. And I really don't feel like I want to, um, you know, to contribute to something that he's going to make money on. I'm, I'm really not interested. So Peter said, really funny, you should bring that up because Sean is really much more going to be involved with Jason X, not Jason Goes to Hell. I said, OK, all right, well, that's that's more interesting right there. I said, Peter, the other problem is um, I have a little bit of an issue with you. Mm. And, uh, and he was like, really? Uh, so I said, um, Peter, you know, in your book, you really kind of screwed me over. And it was, um, there's a lot of information in your book that's factually incorrect. And Peter kind of stopped. And I was like, and listen, dude, if you have a problem with that, I understand. But then we really can't work together. And he said, Adam, he said, I actually, part of the reason I'm calling is to apologize. I said, really? He said, Adam, I had a phone call with Sean Cunningham, and in 45 minutes, he contradicted half of what he told me 15 years ago. I'm like, oh, so you're discovering that Sean is, well, that he's a liar. And that he'll say whatever he needs to say in order to fit a certain perspective. And Peter's like, yeah, yeah, I see it. I was like, because, dude, there's stuff in that book that's just not true that, like, was said about me and what I – and and how much I – Sean claimed to have reshot 60% of the film. Sean, Sean didn't shoot – reshoot one frame of the film. Not a frame. Mm-hmm. It's just not true. So – and by the way, I've got 31, 31 interviews where people are on camera going, yeah, Sean was never on set. What are we talking about? 
So, uh, so anyway, that kind of controversy had been, you know, brewing for years. And because I look, because I have a career that I'm very proud of, I've never really fought back about, about, about this whole thing. Mm -hmm. So Peter comes to my home and he brings this guy, Eddie Samuelson to talk to me and to shoot some footage and to, you know, just to just kind of hang out and get to know each other. And I fell in love with this guy, Eddie. I love Peter. He's him and I have become really close friends over the last couple of years. And that's when I went to the two of them when I was like, you know what? We're going to make this documentary. You guys want to do this. And they both immediately jumped in. I mean, immediately. And I have to tell you, like, the, the documentary, the shape of the documentary, what, where I was coming from was who in, who in God's good earth would give a 23-year-old kid the keys to the largest horror franchise in the history of, 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 of our industry. Who would do that? Like, what lunatic would do that? And, um, and so that's kind of where the movie started. But what's been incredible is that it's turned into something that's more about the kind of bullying that went on behind the scenes um, the, the kind of nastiness that all came from one source. It's all Sean Cunningham, um, where dude, I was so supported by new line. I was so supported by my executives, my crew. At one point we, we had to, we were doing additionals for the film, which, you know, like the 10 scene, the famous 10 scene. <laughs> and so we had, we had three days of additional photography. That's one of those many stuff. scenes that I should never have watched at the age of 13 before I never. knew what. <laughs> no way. Totally <laughs> for 13 year olds that is for sure and, i was like and, is that what that's supposed to be like oh my oh my god yeah yeah well sean cunningham went to my cinematographer and said hey uh we're gonna do reshoots uh you know not reshoots we're gonna do additional photography because we weren't reshooting anything we was just adding stuff and he said we're gonna do additional photography and my dp said great i'll call adam he says well no adam's not gonna direct the the, the, the additionals i'm gonna do it and my cinematographer, Bill Dill, said, well, then I'm not going to shoot them for you, Sean. And he was like, what? He said, no, I will not come back, not, nor will any of the crew. This is Adam's movie, and we love Adam. No, that's not happening, Sean. And Sean had to back down, and Sean came to me and said, Adam, will you direct the additionals? I was like, I thought I was. What are you talking about? Will I? So he tried to steal even those three days from me, and my crew wouldn't show up for him. They wouldn't come. So the truth of Jason Goes to Hell was that like it was made, it was made solely by myself with this weird laundry list of stuff from Sean, like get rid of the damn hockey mask. That was from Sean. And that wasn't I wasn't look, I got hired to to make the movie when I was 22 years old. Mm -hmm. There's no 22 year old who's a huge fan of Friday the 13th who goes. I know what we should do. Let's get rid of the hockey mask. It, it does that does not happen. Right. It just doesn't happen. So the the truth is Sean hated the hockey mask. By the way, classically and always has hated the hockey mask. You can see tons of interviews with him at conventions where he talks about how he thought the hockey mask was the dumbest idea he'd ever heard. Yes. I remember that. And right. And this is the guy trying to say I'm the one who said we have to take the hockey mask out of the movie. And by the way, on, on YouTube, you can also find video of people asking Sean this in public, like at conventions, hey, um, Adam Marcus said, you said take the hockey mask out of the movie. And his response is, Adam Marcus is a fracking liar. Yeah, all you have to do is just type in Jason Goes to Hell on YouTube, and it's just the list of films that comes up. And that's and that, and that at the top is the bio, the rental of the film, but then that's just the list of, and you will easily probably find that quote that you're talking about. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And here's the thing. Whenever, like, I, I just, I, my company made a movie called Secret Santa last year, um, which became a huge hit at, on the festival circuit. We were at London Fright Fest, Glasgow Fright Fest, Sitches, we were everywhere. And at any time I'd be, I'd be doing a Q&A with the audience, someone would bring this up. Like, it always happened. And I'd be like, guys, everybody here, take your phones out. Take them out because you're going to want to put this on YouTube. You're going to want the rights to do this. So I'm telling you, put this out. Um, and I say, okay, let's take this premise. So let's say I said, hey, hey, Sean, I think we should get the hockey mask out of the movie. 
here's a 21 year old kid or 22 year old kid telling Sean Cunningham, here's what you should do with your franchise, Sean Cunningham. This is what you're gonna do. So that makes me like the most powerful 21 year old to ever live because I'm telling the 50 something year old Sean Cunningham what he's gonna do with his franchise. Mm-hmm. Or Sean Cunningham said to me, Adam, get the fracking hockey mask out of the movie. And I said, you got it. You got a boss. What else do you need? You were the youngest director to ever make a Friday the 13th movie and yes. still, still are correct. Yes. I am. I am also the youngest. I was the youngest director at that time. I was the youngest writer or director to ever be hired by a major studio. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was cool. And you were basically handed the keys to a kingdom that they had just um, acquired because Paramount was like, we're done. We we washed him in the sewer with toxic waste because we didn't know how to end it. And you can take it. Absolutely. And by the way, I was told to ignore part eight. I could not follow part eight. Right, right. I remember I read uh, because everyone always questions like how this doesn't make any sense. And and, and it's just like because of it it has nothing to do with like storyline wise, unless you want to get into like the Necronomicon and Supernatural mumbo jumbo and yada, yada, yada. But that's all expanded universe fiction that nobody's ever actually written. I always explain to people it boils down to did you look who made those other movies? Did you look who made the next movie? That's why. Studios crap. And it rates, and then and then the the laundry list of things that to do with like why is the mask different? Why is he not even Jason in this movie? Why is it a body snatching horror film? Right. What was, you know, t- and so on and so on and so on and so on or whatever. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. It, look, I, I, w- I was given what I was given was the character of Jason Voorhees, Camp Crystal Lake, and Pamela Voorhees, and that's it. I couldn't even use Friday the Thirteenth. Right. We didn't have that. No. We didn't that. Yeah. So I, I originally the hero of the movie was supposed to be Tommy Jarvis. And I couldn't have it. I was doing a Tommy movie. I was doing the last chapter. I was doing the here's the thing. <laughs> the, the the first movie, right, that mm-hmm. Sean made had little or nothing to do with Jason Voorhees. It's about a woman whose son dies at a summer camp. Her brain snaps, and she just starts killing anybody who she perceives was the counselor that let her child drown, okay? So that movie is about a mother losing her son. My movie was about a father finding his daughter. Right. And that's what the movie's about. Right, yeah. So I did, I wanted it to be the perfect bookends. I was like, I'm going to end this franchise with a per- because I was told it's the final Friday, when we knew that they were going to take the character and do other stuff with it, which was not up to me and not something I was dealing with. But I knew I'm going to bookend this franchise. So the concept of uh, a mother losing her son and a father gaining his daughter was kind of this perfect sort of bookend. L- and my feeling was Tommy is the villain. I mean, is the, is the in Jason's mind is his antagonist. Right. So what better way to have the person who finally kills Jason for the for the last time be that father who who claims his daughter? Did were you allowed to do um or did was there is there any um truth to the rumors that you weren't allowed to do any world build, um any explanation of things and just do world building and what I mean by that is for example, in The Empire Strikes Back, you just have the bounty hunters show up and that makes so much world building for Star Wars. Sure. In your film, you just have Jason has a sister on all of a sudden, and you're like, mm-hmm. "What is the story with this? What is the story with the Necronomicon? What is the story <laughs> with Clayton Duke hunting down Jason? He's not that Sorry. hard to find if you're this great Sorry. bounty hunter, Mister Duke." Which I always thought was really funny. It's just like, "Are you kidding me? This guy lives around the lake in the woods." I get the cops are a bunch of morons. I'm always like, I, where, where, "Where's this bounty hunter been looking for Jason if he's been hunting him?" <laughs> oh well, no, he hasn't been on it. That's the whole point. Who? The, the, the the thing about Creighton Duke is he has not been hunting Jason. He knows where Jason is. The problem is he can't kill him. Oh, okay. He's the only one who knows you can't kill him unless you have all the pieces of that puzzle. Do you know what you should so, do? I would love to see a, a fan-funded Clayton Duke uh, origin story movie. Like, well, where did he get something. trained? You know? Here, here's, what I, here's what I can tell you. Oh? Um, I am doing... Uh, I am doing... A project with Stephen Williams, uh, who, him and I are still close. Um, we are doing a movie. Um, 
about a Creighton Duke like character who wears a back brace because of a horrible spinal injury. Oh. And so my company is making that movie. Oh. Um, and it's it's in, in, in the great sort of uh, Sergio Leone tradition, you know, sort of man with no name right. kind of thing. Um, because Stephen and I have just always wanted to work together, and uh, we loved doing Jason Goes to Hell together, and we've been trying to figure out how to make this happen, and we figured it out. So, um, so yeah, so him and I are going to be doing something uh, that will be useful to all of that, by the way. So yeah, oh yeah. Um, what I can also tell you, look, here's here's the thing. Here's here's what I tried to do with with the movie, and it'll answer that question that you just had. I, I think pretty thoroughly. My problem, even as a kid, because look, I grew up with these movies literally and figuratively. I was there when they shot the first movie. I was there when Susan Cunningham was editing the second movie. I, in fact, was an apprentice editor to Susan on the movie Spring Break when I was 13. By the way, talk about a movie no 13-year-old should be around. I always say that I walked into the editing room a boy. I left a man. Um, so I was around these films my whole growing up. The thing about, about this, about the franchise is none of it makes sense. It doesn't make any sense. If you take the first movie, just the first movie, and remember, Sean Cunningham did not want to make movies about Jason Voorhees. He wanted, he, Sean Cunningham never found a good idea that he didn't want to steal from John Carpenter. John Carpenter didn't want to make Michael Myers movies. John Carpenter wanted to make movies about Halloween. He wanted to make tales of Halloween. It's why Halloween 3 is truly the only actual John Carpenter sequel in that entire franchise. Because that was his intention. His intention was to make movies about Halloween, not about Michael Myers. The people who own the rights went, we got to make it about Michael Myers. Much the same way that Paramount was with Friday the 13th. Sean wanted to make movies about the unluckiest day of the year. Horrible things that happen on this horrible day. That was his idea. Okay? When suddenly we go from part one about a little boy dying in the 50s, who then, at the end of the movie, because Sean couldn't help but rip off Brian De Palma's carry, he has Jason jump up from the lake and pull Alice down into the, into the depths. That's a great ending, by the way. It's genius. I love the ending, and I, and I love what Sean did with that first film. Um, but here's the thing. He didn't think that was about a franchise. He was making a kind of a creepy, scary moment. Okay. And who knows? Maybe she dreamt it. Maybe it didn't happen. Well, here's the thing. It did happen. Because Paramount said, we like that killer kid in the lake. Let's make movies about the killer kid from the lake. Well, if you notice, Ari Lehman plays him at the end of the movie. Ari Lehman's a little boy. I know because I went to school with Ari Lehman. Ari's a little boy. So the little boy who drowned in the 50s is still a little boy in the 80s. In 1980, he's still a little boy who's stuck at the bottom of the lake. Then, in two weeks' time, Friday 13th Part 2 happens. Because there's only two weeks between those two movies. And somehow, Jason has grown two feet, put on about 140 pounds has figured out how to drive because he gets to Alice's house some way, figured out how to read because he finds in the yellow pages where she lives, ha brings along mom's head in a box, then stages this very elaborate creative murder in Alice's place, kills Alice, then drags Alice's body and the head back to Crystal Lake to put in a shrine. And he has a bag on his head. So... How did that happen in two weeks? All of that happened in two weeks. Right. I love when people complain. I love when people complain that Michael Myers learned how to drive in in fifteen years. Jason grew two feet in two weeks. And it rates right up there with um, somebody just posted on a uh, pretty popular YouTube I watch who they break down like the inconsistencies in films. And he's like, mm -hmm. uh, there is no there is no Google Earth. There is no Google search. There is no Yahoo Maps. How the hell does Jason find out where Alice lives and gets there? Does right. he walk there? Maybe right. she does live close enough there. Maybe she didn't move to the other side of the country. But I thought there was some indication she moved to California or something like that. And Jason is pretty much well established in New Jersey. But hey. Maybe he did walk from New Jersey to California. I had friends that go. did that. There you go. He hitched. <laughs> but here's, because he's such a lovely looking guy. Um, but here's the next part. 
So now you go to part three, he gets a hockey mask, and it really is so completely indiscriminate that he gets a hockey mask, even though it's 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 badass and it's awesome. Yes. Okay. We then move on to part four, and I don't know, but I watched part four pretty religiously, pretty terrific movie. At the end of that film, Corey Feldman chops up Jason's head to hamburger meat. He decimates Jason. So Jason is dead at the end of part four. So much so that part five is a guy named Roy. <laughs> yes. And not only is it a guy named Roy, but in my favorite moment in the entire franchise, and I'm not kidding, it is my single favorite moment of the entire franchise, Roy, the ambulance driver, happens to carry a photograph from a newspaper article of Jason. And what's funny is Jason, go, uh, Jason uh, Friday the 13th Part 5 is the first VHS tape that my parents bought me for a Christmas gift awesome. one Christmas. Dude, that is awesome. And I was that like, brilliant. so confused because I don't How think I... How old were you? Uh, I was still a teenager, but I was definitely older than when I saw your movie inappropriately. Because okay. uh, here's the thing, part five... Part but five still is... not appropriate to watch a movie where two people have sex in the woods and it's a long shot of boobs on the ground before you know the oh, scissors yeah. come down into the eyeballs and then of course years later learning out oh the director of that movie is porn director right <laughs> dude that movie that movie is so dirty that I, what i love about part five is you can almost see the, the like the dirt under its fingernails it's so dirty right it's and a dirty movie which by the way is i think it's charm i think that's why part five is so charming like it's a real horror movie like it's a gross in your face the murders are just ugly and and vicious and right. i mean it's a it's nuts that and, movie is nuts and bring I mean, it the whole movie happens because a kid w won't stop with his chocolate bar I mean, oh my oh my nuts. god that guy yeah and, and and geez i feel so bad for that actor who was unfortunately passed away i think it was yeah. in 2006 he died um uh, yeah. but um he uh i I do another podcast called the Vampire Movie Minute Podcast, and we talk about a vampire movie five minutes at a time. We're currently doing Once Bitten. There are four actors from the Friday the 13th franchise in that movie. One plays uh, 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 Flower Girl Vampire, Cabin Boy Vampire, <laughs> and the uh, overweight kid from Friday the 13th Part 5 mm -hmm. comes up to Jim mm -hmm. Carrey's ice cream truck and knocks on the window while he's making out with Robin and says, do you have a punchicle? I'm like, did you not get it at the camp? Stop asking for a punchicle. It's going to lead to bad things. If a it's psycho... Amazing. Uh, classmates gonna kill you in one movie it's gonna be vampires in this movie kid get lost <laughs> and like my co-host awesome. is just like how do you w wait what do you mean there's like four people from Friday the 13th movie and like, there's four actors from Friday the 13th in this movie and they all are dead well, no except for the cabin boy vampire actually plays the guy left behind at the bar in part two who was probably well, like awesome. whoo yeah, dodged sure, the bullet not sure. going back to camp that night <laughs> That is awesome. And did you ever read, by the way, the Jason, Freddy, Ash, Williams, uh, you know, Evil Dead Ash comic book Dude, crossover? Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. Probably. But because because that's what I started with Jason Goes to Hell, because here's what here's here's what happens. Part five is so annoying to the fans because it's not Jason. Yeah. That they then jump to part six. They still have Tommy from part four to part five. They bring him back for part six. Now you've got Frankenstein's monster zombie right. coming out of the grave, right? Yep. Part seven, they're literally out of ideas. They're like, I don't know. Why don't, well, Sean ripped off Carrie in the first movie. Why don't we do Jason versus Carrie? Right. And by part eight, they're going like, um, well, what if he went up against an entire city? So he'll go to New York because New York is dangerous, but we, we don't have the money to shoot New York. So we'll shoot on a boat, then in Montreal, and then we'll do a day in New York. How's that sound? I mean, this is literally how bad the ideas were getting at that point. So, And then they got worse when, when they I went got, to space. <laughs> right, when, I got, when, when I literally got this jumbled mess of movies and they were like, okay, make your movie, kid. And get the hockey mask out of there. I was like, okay. Well, I've always really been annoyed at the timeline. And there's only one way, as I saw it, that you could make all of this stuff make sense. Which is go back to mom. Go back to the origin of the whole story. Go back to the first movie. If Pamela is so dead set on saving her child, 
Well, wouldn't she do anything to save her child? Wouldn't she even make a deal with the devil to save her child? So if Pamela gets her hands on the Necronomicon and speaks those incantations for her child, now cut to this pork. And by the way, we're not saying Deadite. It could be a revenant. It could be, it could be, a, th those pages are full. I love that everybody's always like, in, in the Evil Dead, one page is read aloud. One page. You know how long that book is? Right. And my sense was, what if this woman... It's about 200-something pages. You can pick it up at Barnes & Noble. <laughs> there you go. What, what, if, what if this woman resurrects her child? He's at the bottom of the lake and has no idea where he is. And he's just in the darkness, and he's terrified. You know, and I, here's this thing in the in the bottom of the lake, I not love, knowing where to go. I love Wildstorm's idea, and I don't know how PC it is today with certain things that we don't want to mm -hmm. keep using over and over again for certain cultures. But um, in the Wildstorm comic book series, Wildstorm, for anyone listening, was a division of DC Comics owned by Jim yep. Lee. Now Jim Lee basically is the head honcho of DC Comics. Um, yep. They had an origin story of the evil essence inside Jason explaining that it was the white men came to Friday the third uh, Crystal Lake killed all the Native Americans the Native Americans basically got their revenge by finding a vessel that they can enact a revenge on the white man for and every year the curse just happens to find the next dead body to pass itself on to that year just happened to be Jason Voorhees yeah I guess I like my story better because here's the thing I love the evil dead Love the freaking Evil Dead. My favorite thing in the world. My other problem with horror movies in general, especially in the 80s, everybody acts like they've never seen a horror movie. Nobody's ever seen a horror movie. They all do all this. I mean, they make Geico commercials about how dumb people in horror movies are. And that's where Wes Craven got part of the idea for Scream to be self right. Right. Exactly. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Referential. Self-referential. Thank you. Yeah, yes. and that's why Scream is such a brilliant movie and still exactly. one of my favorite. Exactly. I will rewatch Scream two, three, maybe as well, man, four. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. But the first one over and over again. I think it's so brilliant. I think Wes Craven it's was brilliant. just. Just beyond anyone's comprehension of how brilliant of a director he was most of the time. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more, man. <laughs> yeah. I, he's he's uh, remarkable. But here's the thing. I also was a kid who grew up when, at a time when, look, I, I, don't, know if you, I don't know if you've ever seen this episode, but maybe, maybe not. But I remember the coolest thing I'd ever seen was when I'm watching Scooby-Doo and Batman <laughs> shows up on Scooby-Doo. And actually, and like, there's a whole cartoon on Scooby-Doo right now where guest stars are showing up on it. It's a new Scooby-Doo right. cartoon. Uh, right. They've had, you, I don't know the list of celebrities they've had on there, but they've had a lot of horror people too, which is great. Well, here's the thing for me. I'm like, um, wait a minute, Batman knows Scooby-Doo? And then the Harlem Globetrotters were on the next week. I was like, what is happening with Scooby-Doo? Like, they're all friends? And suddenly, for my money... I became in love with the idea of a shared universe before Marvel, before all these things. I love the idea of all of these creatures inhabiting the same place and the same time. So I was like, look, why can't the Evil Dead be part of the Friday 13th lore? It can be. By the way, of course, then Wildstorm picks up the idea of like, let's mash them all together. Right. Well, yeah, of course. And for anyone but who wants that story, it's wonderfully explained in a lot of detail on the aforementioned Crystal Lake Chronicles that Adam mentioned. Yes. So here's the thing. It's also how Freddy got involved because I, the whole Freddy thing, that was my idea. We were sitting in, 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 in our apartment, myself, my co-writer, Dean Laurie, and uh, Sean Cunningham's son, Noel, who was, uh, was the second assistant editor on the film, we all shared an apartment for years. And we were talking, we were kind of beefing up the script and talking about sort of like gags I could put in the movie and other, other horror characters I could include and, and who can I drag in. And I suddenly said, wait a second, guys, New Line owns Freddy outright. They're like, yeah, I think, I think they do. I said, Oh, man, I got an idea for the ending. I said, they just killed Freddy and Freddy's dead. So Freddy is in hell right now. Who better to drag Jason to hell than Freddy? Right. So I called Mike DeLuca and Mark Rodesky. I woke him up in the middle of the night. I was like, guys, can I have the glove and, and Robert's laugh? And they're like, what do you want it for? And I told them my ending the next day I had it. So it was this idea to fit. Look, here's the thing. If Jason's at the bottom of Crystal Lake 
and he's been there for 30 years, scared and alone. This poor kid, this, this, this hydrocephalic headed kid laying at the bottom of this lake in the darkness, terrified, buried alive. And the first thing he sees lakeside is his mother get decapitated by this, by this young woman. Well, that would bring him back to the surface. And now you've got a character that is not a human being. You've got Hell's assassin. You've got this revenant creature. You've got this deadite. And now him growing two feet, I buy it. Him getting a suit of clothes and finding a way into town, I got it. Everything Jason does from that point, I go, yeah. Now it now, now at least makes logical sense in a horror movie universe. I buy all the stuff that happens to Jason at that point. And so that was the purpose of putting all of that stuff into Jason Goes to Hell was to give this film some sense of, uh, of, of logic. I, I know it sounds crazy for this kind of movie, but I, I got to tell you, I don't like when studios undercut the intelligence of their audience. I don't like when somebody says, ah, they don't care. Just give them lots of blood, which is the kind of stuff they say. Kids are idiots. They don't know what they like. I've literally heard people say that. Mm-hmm. And I just go, wait a minute, man. I was one of those kids. Like, I'm not okay with that. I, I, I think we have to treat our audience with a tremendous amount of respect. So that's where Jason Goes to Hell came from, was this idea of like, I'm going to figure out a logic that makes the previous eight installments, even part eight, I'm going to make those movies make sense. So that was the concept behind it. I was basically trying to do the Rogue One of the of the of the Friday the Thirteenth franchise. Ha <laughs> ha! There's um, I don't know when the last time the uh, the site was updated, but there's um, some people missing that are like key figures of the movie for the documentary, and uh, but I haven't looked at I haven't compared to what's on the site versus what's listed on IMDb. Of course, IMDb anybody can update, so I don't know how accurate that is. But right. um, who are you still missing for the documentary from the movie? Um, well, we are, uh, we're talking, you and I spoke before the program about John D. LeMay. Um, John is going to be, uh, we're interviewing him after the pandemic is, has, has subsided. Um, he's one of the few people that we hadn't gotten to talk to. Um, Aaron Gray, we're talking to Michelle Clooney. Um, I'm trying to think actor wise. We've got a, a bunch of crew people that are coming on as well that we haven't talked to yet. Um, the but mom, we, what's her name? I don't remember the mom's character's name. The, the actual oh, Aaron, niece of Jason. Oh, Aaron Gray. Aaron Gray. No, that's, no, no. That, that's, that's no, that's of, the, well, I meant her daughter. Sorry. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Uh, Carrie Keegan. Here's the thing about Carrie. Carrie left the business. Um, Carrie did Jason Goes to Hell. She did a couple of commercials after that. And then that was it. She she became a mom, and she has a whole other life. And quite frankly, for years, there was all this bad blood between her and I. Oh. And and so and by the way, we totally buried the hatchet. We're, 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 we're totally good now. But I got to tell you, I think she just kind of put that chapter behind her, the, the actress chapter. I think she's really happy with her life. We didn't even bother her. We didn't even, we didn't even bother her about it because she's notorious for going like, I don't, I don't talk about it. I don't, I don't talk about my years in Hollywood. I, she doesn't do that. So, um, so we're just kind of respecting her, her wishes on that. Gotcha. Um, but, yeah, that's uh, if you saw the You're So Cool Brewster, the Friday the 13th, uh, Friday the 13th, uh, Fright Night documentary. Oh, yeah, the Fright Night doc. Yeah, they're yeah. Charlie's second girlfriend in college who was in a yes. little horror comedy called My My Boyfriend's Back. She also disappeared and declined any involvement in any uh, interviews. I even was able to reach out to her. And way, she's like, I, way, I, I, I appreciate you reaching out to me, but I don't talk about anything in Hollywood anymore. Do you know that I'm I'm the producer of My, of my Boyfriend's Back? Oh, no, that's very cool. Yes, yes. I, I'm actually, the reason why I got Jason Goes to Hell, the reason why that happened, I brought a script from New York to Hollywood when I, when I started working for Sean Cunningham right out of film school. I was 21. Uh, I just graduated NYU, won Best Picture there. And my, 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 uh, my best friend, Dean Laurie, had written a script called Johnny's On. And I brought that to L.A., and I'm the one who set that up for Sean at Disney. And that's... That's my boyfriend's back. Oh, so that's awesome. I was supposed to, that was supposed to be my directorial debut. And then Disney bought it and they were going to put like, you know, $8 million behind it. I was like, okay, I'm not directing this movie. <laughs> I was like, that's not going to happen. Um, and Sean said, you know, I said, look, I said, Sean, you owe me a movie. And he went, all right, well, 
they're bringing the Friday Thirteenth franchise to to New Line. You want to do it? He's like, if you can get that, if you can get that fracking hockey mask out of the movie, I'll let you direct it. I was like, uh, yeah, okay, cool, cool, yeah. And I, so I and, that, and, and, and how that happened. And in 2013, and this movie came out on my birthday in 2013, uh, early January release, where is the dumping ground for horror movies these days. In fact, if you looked at how many horror movies came out this past January before the quarantine happened, it was like six mm-hmm. horror movies. Um, on my birthday, I was sitting through the credits, and I was like, oh, Adam Marcus, that name looks familiar, for Texas Chainsaw 3D. And I was like, I wonder if that's the same one who did the movie. And then find yeah, out skippy. before you came on the show. Yep, it is. That is me. Um, Texas Chainsaw, uh, here's what's really interesting about, about that. By the way, about that date, that was the first time that Lionsgate had done that. That was the first time that they made that a horror date. Um, Prior to that, it wasn't. And here's what's great about that moment in time. Um, We prevented Django Unchained from ever going to number one. Django. Oh, right. The, um, yep. Yeah. The yeah. Quentin yeah. Tarantino uh, Quentin Tarantino's, yep. uh, movie. Yep. But the, we, the... we, we beat it. They, that we were neck and neck with that movie and we beat it. We got number one and Django never went to number one. Um, so that's when Lionsgate went, Oh wow. We got a, we got a really special horror weekend here. And that from that point forward, that's all that would, that Lionsgate would release on that weekend was a horror film. And they've done it ever since. I called. There's a local company that deals with like Hollywood's uh, marketing stuff for all the different areas, and ours is allied here. Uh huh. Sure. I had called them. Uh, I call them once in a while, email them, and they send stuff to give away. And they and they were like, "You're the only person asking about Texas Chainsaw, so we're just going to send you what we have." And I was like, "Great!" And then like two mm-hmm. giant coffee table size boxes show up at my front door and I dragged it in and one of them contains 150 mm-hmm. Texas Chainsaw 3D t-shirts. <laughs> it was That's awesome. It was unbelievable. I was giving away like Dude. crazy. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with them. Bro, gave, if you still by the way if you still have some of those, man, they never gave us any t-shirts. No, unfortunately. I mean, that was uh, seven years ago. Definitely, oh, unfortunately, shame. don't. Um, that's a shame. I know. Yeah, but I, dude, I was crazy. able to like, give that's... I was able to give a t-shirt to both um, uh, uh, Gunnar Hansen and uh, nice. the that's awesome. actor who played Leatherface in the movie. Oh, Dan. Dan, yes. Dan. Dan, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they both came yeah, yeah. to uh, yeah, Rock. Awesome. They both came to Rock and Shock the uh, the no, following dude, year. I, so they sent. I, I I wish I did. I'm sorry, man. Um, I no, 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 they are no, long, no, long gone. Just, we never got those. I will tell you one thing. We did get from Lionsgate, which was amazing. So the movie came out number one, and so they so they sent us. Um, no one could get these, which was incredible. Uh, they sent us the uh, the 3D ventriculated posters. Oh wow. That's really so, cool. I have a light box in my office with the 3D poster. And it's amazing because anybody who passes always jumps out of the way because the saw comes right at you. Oh. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was uh, – no, Deb, my, my writing partner, my, my wife and my best friend, Deborah Sullivan, um, she and I wrote that together. Uh, and, uh, yeah, man, we, 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 that was – that was a slog fest. We 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 had to beat seventeen other writing teams to get that job. So um, I just so I have the names correctly. Uh, I'm trying to. Okay, so Jessica is out for the documentary. Uh, or sorry, yeah. Carrie. Sorry, Car- Carrie Keegan is out. Who Carrie else? Yeah, who um, who else have you not had a, an ability to track down? Um, the only other person that we've really wanted in the doc that we haven't been able to track down because she's kind of gone silent, it's very weird, um, is uh, Allison Smith, who uh, played Vicky, who I was very close with for a long time. And then truly, like, no one even knows who her agent is anymore. It's wild. The girl in the tent. So, no, 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 no. We got her. No, no, not the girl in the tent. Oh. Vicky, the, the, the redhead who... Um, with the shotgun in the diner, really she takes care of the baby. Yeah. yeah, she does that yeah. great like flip up scene yeah. with the shotgun, which is like, yes. that is not easy. Shotguns are not light weapons. <laughs> no, they are not. She's a ba- <laughs> she was a badass then, and she look, dude. By the way, that that girl when when I cast her because she and I were about the same age. Um, when I cast her, I was twenty three at the time, and. Uh, and the two of us, uh, when I first met her, 
I was like, I was like, Allison Smith. I said, were you ever Annie on Broadway? And she was like, oh my God. Yeah. I was the second Annie. I said, yeah, I was 10 years old when I saw you in, on Broadway. That's crazy. So I had known her all that time, but she also played uh, the daughter on the television show, Kate and Allie. Um, so she had a, she had a very significant career and, um, dude, she, she was, by the way, that bit with the, with the shotgun was originally supposed to be Carrie's character and Carrie couldn't do it. And that's when I turned to, to Alison Smith as like, hon, today's your day. Let's do it. And she, she, she handled that shotgun like a pro. She was so, oh, dude, her. And Rusty Schwimmer, who played Joey B, the woman who ran the diner. You're right. The three of us were like peas in a pod. Like, I hung out with them all the time. They were hilarious. And I'm telling you, Allison's the only person that I'm not able to get. Uh, we just haven't been able to find her. I'm still on the lookout. I'm still going to try to make it happen. And then there, but, and, and then you also made a post asking, like, uh, for fans to be like, who would you love to see in the documentary? Or you did or somebody did. And, and, and I remember posting saying, get people from the Tops comic. Oh, absolutely. Uh, by the way... Dude, I went, I toured for Tops. That's cool. I toured for them for two months with that comic book. And not only that, but I was a design consultant for Sideshow for the Jason Goes to Hell figure for the for their for their um 12 inch scale. Uh-huh. For their one sixth. And dude, I mean, it was uh I had such a good time on the with the marketing team from New Line on that movie. They were amazing. Like that was New Line's genius. Their marketing team was incredible. Just incredible. So, yeah, I was with the top guy. I went. I actually went to Tops in New York. To um, They took me on a tour of the place. And I have, like, a bunch of the uncut sheets of cards, of all the, the cards they made, the, the trading cards. That's awesome. Yeah, they're, they were great. They're, they're a great company. They're just freaking great. Because those, those trading cards, unless you didn't get uh, – uh, let me start over uh, – if you didn't get if you didn't get the magazine for the movie, uh, which came right. out, which was fan, which was like my big exposure to it, because my, again, my parents were not sure. going to take me to see that movie. Uh, you never <laughs> got to see, and if you didn't see the magazine, in the cards were your only way of seeing the uh, weird demon Jason creature thing. Yeah, the, the, the thing that's yep. in all the photos that very few people even know what the heck that is. Yep. And what I love, because uh, I was, I guess I was 25 when the cards came out, right? It was just right after the movie had come out. Uh -huh. And I just turned 25. And uh, I remember thinking, because I was, a, I, I've always been a trading card kid. Like I was a big baseball card fan and all that stuff when I was growing up. And when I got my, my trading, that there was an Adam Marcus trading card, trading card. I was like, oh man, like talk about life goals. Like I'm done. I'm done. I've got, I've got my own baseball card. What are you kidding me? I'm right. good. Right, the uh, you you have your own trading card is it, it, just like saying uh, just like a character, an original character that you created that you own. The thing that makes that iconic nowadays is also like uh, because trading cards aren't as big anymore. But uh, the right. thing that makes that would make this iconic if you created a character for a movie, Adam, uh, is if somebody mm -hmm. cosplays as it. Oh, dude! Then they're your they are your walking free marketing machine. Because people are going to come up you and go, bet. who are you? Oh, I'm from this like little movie where this new character was created, and it's blah, 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 yep. blah. And it obviously works more for uh, comic book uh, comic cons uh, with comic book characters sure. than horror sure. icons. But Because uh, horror icons are the, the, the deepest dive. But that's the equivalent nowadays because trading cards are so, uh, you know, not as um, big as they used to be. Right, right. Look, dude, for me, I got to tell you, every time I go to a convention, any horror con, and somebody's dressed as a part nine Jason, um, that the, the, the sense of pride I get over that is you can't imagine. And I will tell you, I've met a bunch of Creightons. There have been a bunch of Creighton Dukes. And those guys, like, I, also for me, it's really awesome that uh, that our movie created an African American character that people wanted to cosplay, that people wanted to emulate, right? Know? That wasn't wasn't a victim. Here's a guy who is, you know, I, I always love when people think that Creighton is Reggie the Reckless grown up. Ah, like, wow. <laughs> that like, is that's awesome. An insane timeline, but okay. Um, but uh, but they are. Think about. It. I mean, they are two very positive, um, cool characters. Uh, in a litany of characters, and it's very t the, the 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 thing about Jason Goes Tell that I'm really proud of now, in hindsight, especially, 
And again, I didn't do it for any other purpose than I wanted the best movie. But that is an inclusive movie, Jason Goes to Hell, like in a big way. Um, and yeah, the and they also, that that's, that's the, uh, uh, there are a lot of movies that do this, but there are a lot of movies that don't do this. There is never once mentioned of Creighton Duke being a black guy, an African-American, and it never a race never. thing in that movie, not even an iota. And he, they, they never even make a big deal about like, oh, a woman's going to be able to defeat Jason. Uh, ha, 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 that's, ha, right. that's pretty funny. That's, that's right. never mentioned either, whatever. So that's also yep. two very progressive things. And when I met Stephen Williams, I mentioned that to him and he goes, thank you. Not a lot of people realize that they never mentioned yep. that I'm black in that movie. Every other that's thing right. I do, uh, even on the X-Files, he said, it's never mentioned once that I'm a black guy in the X-Files. I'm like, no, it's not. Yep. You're just a mean SOB. And he's like, damn right. And then I, he right. signed my uh, he signed my copy of the, the DVD. That's awesome. <laughs> Stevens, uh, Stevens the man. He's, he is, he's uh, it was such a pleasure to meet him. He was alongside the other, he was at Rhode Island Comic Con, and he was alongside some other people from uh, Supernatural, because he was going to be on a Supernatural yeah, panel. sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Steven, Steven is uh, Steven's extraordinary. I, I adore Steven. He's, yeah. He's amazing dude. Amazing dude. What, so uh, so the, the, uh, the, the documentary has now been pushed back to December 2020, and it gives chance yeah. to, uh, for people to go to the uh, – what's the uh, Facebook page for the documentary? The Facebook page is Hearts of Darkness, The Making of the Final Friday. Awesome. So well, that's that's the Facebook page. Everyone, please go there to just check out more information about the documentary we're talking about. Adam, I thank you so much for coming on the show with me. Dude, it's been my absolute pleasure. You're awesome. No, you are awesome. This has been a dream come true because, again, Jason Goes to Hell was the first Friday the 13th movie I saw on a big screen, and I was just blown away because I knew I, – I definitely had seen Friday the 13th prior to this, uh, a couple of the films, five, one – in no order. I, let me tell you, the order of watching these <laughs> right. movies was so whacked. Uh, USA Up All Night was the big big help with some of these movies. Sure, sure. And then, because I saw one after seeing a few of the others, and I'm like, wait a minute, wait, it's the mom? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> awesome so good and now i show people the first one who, who think that jason is the big bad killer and then i was just like and then i look at their reactions like did you know it was the nope. mom and they were like no i had no idea anything about mom no, it's this it's this middle-aged lady in a sweater right 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 yeah. right um yep. and then i and then i talk about the tv series and i'm like wait there was a tv series <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, Steven um, comes from uh, this antique store, and then he was like, oh, wait, that's right. I knocked up this girl. I got to go take care of my kid. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I don't show him the real ending of what happens to Steven, that he de-ages back into a child and that whole, like, whatever. That was yep. the setup to one day being like, okay, so he's alive. We're going to re-age him back to John D. LeMay so he can come back on the show for a couple episodes. Um, yeah. That was it, – it's it, – it, that, that's basically their way of having their cake and eating it too yes it is um yes, but is. Uh, <laughs> again adam thank you so much for coming on the show i really look My forward pleasure. to the documentary you got it brother